Corey and the, the organizing committee, it's a tremendous honor to have the opportunity to, to speak to such uh, a notable group of, of breeders here. And uh, I would like to just uh, amend what Corey said. I'm the treasurer for the Bowie Volunteer Fire Department and Rescue Squad Incorporated. Um, and so today was exciting because we drove past the Pierce uh, factory on the way from the airport and I got to see where I mail a $109,000 check every year uh, to pay for our newest piece of equipment. And um, my name is on the slide here, uh, the, the title slide, but a lot of the ideas in here are not original to me. They come out of lots of reading and thinking and discussing these topics with colleagues. Um, you know, maybe perhaps most notably my colleague Christian Malteca at NC State, but not limited to Christian. So um, I'm, perhaps I'll even explain what the heck this title means as we go through the slides. And um, so I'm going to give a, a brief overview here. So I'm going to actually remind us all what inbreeding is and what causes it. And uh, I hope none of you are too worried. There aren't going to be any funny equations where you have to count back how many generations from the last common ancestor and all of that. We're just going to make sure we all agree on the idea. I'm going to uh, discuss the idea of whether or not inbreeding is bad, which, you know, M Mike already um, talked about that a little bit, which maybe frees me up to make some other points without getting off schedule. How do we measure inbreeding? Uh, again, Mike did a nice job of hinting um, that our thinking on some of these topics is changing a little bit over time. Um, is inbreeding changing in the Holstein breed? That's always something we should actually look at. What can we do about it? Can we or should we do anything? And then I have a few maybe conclusions at the end, say take home type messages. So what causes inbreeding? Well, in, in some ways I feel like this gets made out to be more complicated than it really is. Inbreeding simply is, is the result of um, mating animals that are related to each other. And uh, all, all of the equations that you might have seen in undergraduate animal breeding are just trying to tell you the coefficient of inbreeding is the proportion um, of, of genes that are shared in common because they came from the same place somewhere back in a pedigree. And this is an important point. Inbreeding is inevitable in a finite population. Every population uh, in the world is finite, so inbreeding will eventually accumulate over the long term. So we can manage it, but we, there's not a magic way to not have inbreeding. And the, the pedigree you see on the right there is a Holstein pedigree from an inbreeding experiment conducted in Beltsville, Maryland, uh, starting in 1933. And I know, it's, I know you can't read it from there, but if, if you look uh, back on the sire side, you see a bull named Lad over and over and over and over again. So uh, before uh, they produced this cow, she was the most highly inbred in the Holstein experiment, uh, about 65% inbreeding. Now the, uh, our beef cattle colleagues said we can top that, and so they produced Dominette, the cow on whom the genome, bovine, gene, uh, bovine genome is based, and I think she was about 75% inbred. But here in Beltsville, they got to uh, about 65% in both the Holsteins and the Guernseys quit breeding back and the experiment sort of ran out of steam. So we've known about inbreeding for a very long time and about some of the problems. Now, we all, uh, I'm a geneticist, so I want to find ways to do things more efficiently and do things maybe help us go faster. The problem, of course, is that if we have more efficient selection, we're also going to have more inbreeding. That's almost inevitable. And uh, so Gregor Mendel, you know, discovered some basic principles of inheritance in 1865. That didn't really contribute much to inbreeding. He was just trying to figure out how do these things work. And then uh, Ronald Fisher said, well, wait a minute. What if instead of having one gene that contributes to a trait that we can observe, what if you have lots of genes? And so that helped us start going a little bit faster. In the 30s, Sewell Wright was working at um, Beltsville before he went to University of Chicago and became really famous. And so he developed the idea of using the pedigree to quantify inbreeding. And that didn't immediately help us go faster, um, but it will in a minute, because we had selection index, which was developed at Iowa State. And that was a way of taking information about more than one trait, combining that information into a single number that can be used to rank animals and make decisions. 
And then um, through various mathematical uh, permutations, Henderson took some of the ideas from selection index and included information about the pedigree and uh, developed some more statistical tools to give us uh, what ultimately led to the animal model. So we have uh, mixed models, right? And uh, so that really started going a little faster. Then we get to genomic prediction and then the uh, enhancement of the relationship matrix to be based on the actual DNA passed from one animal to another rather than an estimate from the pedigree. And as, uh, as Mike showed and Corey showed in his introduction, wow, we've really started to go pretty fast uh, with all of that. And uh, because the adoption of genomics has been so widespread and so fast in the industry, we have more genotypes than, uh, I won't say than we know what to do with, but I can tell you that in 2008 when we were working on this, I don't think any of us anticipated in particular how common genotyping of females uh, would become. So we have lots and lots and lots of genotypes that allows us to be even more selective in some ways when we're making genetic decisions and that allows us to put even more pressure into our selection programs. And what we're really all trying to do at the end of the day here, whether we realize it or not in a, in a breeding sense, is we're trying to take all of the best DNA that we can find in the population and put it all together in one animal. So what, what this figure is trying to tell you is, is I went into the data and I said, uh, this, is, this is for net merit, so these values here are net merit dollars. So I said, what's the, what's the best chromosome one that's in the population? And what if we could match that up with the absolute best chromosome two in the population? And I did that for all the chromosomes. And so if we did that, this is sort of a thought exercise, right? We'd end up with an animal that has a breeding value of about 7,300 for net merit, or say about a 3,600 PTA. So um, we still have a long way to go, but the more pressure we put trying to reach this point, um, the more we're going to be driven by both the mathematics of it and um, other considerations. We're gonna be led to even more heavy mating within certain lines. That's gonna drive our inbreeding. And uh, you've already seen the figure on the left, but like I say, and in fact, I think if we were to update this figure, I think what you're going to see is I think you're gonna see even more, a, a shorter generation interval through the dams of bull side. So we're actually starting to put even more pressure there than we had been in the last few years. The figure on the right, um, that's productive life, and that's simply showing you the selection differential. The selection differential is just a, a fancy way of saying how selective are we being when we make breeding decisions there. And you can see that we're actually selective now because genomics helps us identify the best DNA in the best animals. And really, at the end of the day, um, we're in a race, and it seems like it's a race that never ends, right? I'm, um, we're all trying to find that high-index bull, or maybe, um, in, you know, for breeders, you're trying to find that high-index female that can go in the sale tonight. And uh, then Jan Birma gets to write uh, an article in Holstein International about how much money it sold for at the auction. So AI bulls are, are going to be bred to meet the market demand. Okay, so if the demand in the marketplace is for high index, that's what they're going to do. You know, um, so if you're not willing to pay for diversity, or if you're not willing to pay for less inbreeding, the market's not going to provide it. So the bulls with the best genetic merit are the bulls that can be marketed and the most semen sold from. Lower in, if you want to slow your inbreeding down, in most cases, you're going to have a lower rate of genetic gain. So if you slow down, but your competitors don't slow down, well, everybody gets further and further ahead of you. And then, um, so that's my question at the bottom of the slide for everyone to think about as we think about diversity and we think about the positive and negative effects of inbreeding. Who in this room is willing to go slower in their genetic selection program so that we can better control inbreeding? Are you willing to watch your neighbors and your competitors go faster? Um, so is inbreeding bad? Because I know some of my colleagues um, have achieved some notability for discussing inbreeding, and there's a lot of focus, uh, there's, there's the assumption, inbreeding is bad and we all know it's bad. Well, is that actually true? 
Well, in a general sense, yes, it is true. High levels of inbreeding are undesirable in the long run. So the, the table on the right here is some old numbers on in, some uh, impact of inbreeding on some traits. Uh, there, you know, Mike showed a similar slide with some Canadian data. I simply went and pulled these particular numbers because they represent typical numbers. I mean, these came out of uh, Van Vleck and Schmidt's um, Introduction to Dairy Science text, but if you looked at Legates and Warwick's um, Introduction to Animal Breeding that many of us used in college, you would see similar figure, you know, similar numbers. So this is nothing new. We know that you have decreased fertility, decreased longevity, decreased resistance to disease, and all of these other things when you dramatically increase the levels of inbreeding in the population. Why does this happen? This happens because when, when inbreeding levels increase, we're more likely to pair up two undesirable copies of a gene in the same location. Um, you know, and, and I'll come back, but the, a good example to think about is think about something like Holstein haplotype 1, right? That's a mutation in a gene called APAF1. When that gene is broken, the embryo dies. And so it affects fertility because the cow, the, the cow is bred, a pregnancy is established. So that bull gets that cow pregnant, but then the embryo dies and you're back to the beginning. This mechanism is thought to account for most of the undesirable effects of inbreeding. There are uh, a lively debate about some other things that we won't talk about here because they contribute much less to inbreeding. There's also some thinking and there's some data from conservation genetics um, to show it. If, if you inbreed but you do it slowly, you can purge um, the harmful loci, which is a way to say that you can get rid of the undesirable loci, keep the desirable loci. And again, Mike sort of got at this when he talked about the idea that if you do inbreeding and you have purging, you can end up with long stretches of DNA that are homozygous, but they're homozygous for the alleles that you want instead of the alleles that you don't want. The challenge is that it's very difficult to do that effectively. Okay, and then, you know, so what's the deal with hitchhiking anyway? This often happens because inheritance happens on, phys, you know, on chromosomes, right? And what will often happen is you'll have a desirable stretch of DNA, and then you'll have an undesirable piece of DNA that's physically close to it. So that undesirable locus gets dragged along when you're selecting for the, the positive alleles, and that's, uh, that's called hitchhiking. And uh, that's the cause of a lot of what we're worried about. Now, I'm just going to remind everybody, right, we're all used to Mendel's pea plants. And I just discussed HH1 very briefly. It's the same kind of mechanism. Okay, in this case, I'm showing you the little bee, little bee makes the flower uh, white instead of purple. In the case of HH1, when you get two of those, um, two of the minor alleles paired up, you get a dead embryo. But this is a classical model. This model actually describes a lot, of the, a, a lot of characteristics we observe in cattle, chickens, pigs, dogs. And um, this, th this drives our inbreeding. And then um, I just wanted to take an aside because I agree with, uh, with Dan a lot. I like to see pictures too. So I was in Europe a few years ago and I was in the Czech Republic and this, uh, this I suppose this foundation you see here, this is actually the foundation for one of Mendel's greenhouses. So um, as a geneticist, we make our pilgrimage here too to see, uh, to see where it all started, just like folks might go on farm tours or visit notable breeders to learn about uh, the history and tradition of what we're doing in cattle. And Mike showed a version of this. I have a little bit longer list and it's all Holstein specific. Um, I would like to point out that not all genes that have a recessive mode of inheritance are undesirable. Um, and actually, uh, so we see some things like red coat color. Um, horned is actually the, the recessive. Uh, polled is dominant. We don't really like necessarily like horned as much these days. We know the consumers are starting to put a little pressure on us. Um, and if I had time, and I don't know if I have time, Corey, but you see that the only one of these that we don't know the gene for is the HH2 haplotype. I think we have it. 
And we did a really cool study to figure out what's going on there. I don't think I have time to talk about it, unfortunately. Um, but maybe somebody can ask me about it later. Now, is the number of defects in our population increasing? Because some folks say, you know, I, I go to meetings, I do try to go and visit with farmers and learn from them because there's so much that I don't know. And people say, wow, our, is, is our breeding or our breeding practices leading to more of these harmful genetic conditions? Because every time I open hordes dairymen or you know, I hear, uh, I hear someone talk, there's a new haplotype. Every time I go to the CDC website, oh, now there's HH6. Well, there was a study uh, several years ago now, but it was a, of, of a large collection of human uh, whole genome DNA sequence data, and they estimated that every human, so each of us in this room, has a, our genome has about 100 genes where there's a loss of function mutation, and that's just a fancy way of saying that the gene is broken. The protein that's supposed to come from that gene doesn't come from that gene because it's cut off prematurely. And then there are about 20 genes that are completely inactivated, so they don't produce any product at all. And um, I think most of us in this room would look around and we would say, well, that, that sounds alarming in principle, but I don't see any extra thumbs or third eyes or anything. It's simply, it's the nature of the genome. It's uh, very complicated, and uh, you can have something broken in one place, and there's compensation in another place to make up for it. So the mutations are there, even if we haven't identified them. It's not that the rate of mutation has increased in our, in our animals, it's that we have new tools that let us more effectively identify those changes. And so, for example, I mentioned HH6, which is the latest haplotype that we've published. Uh, we, we thought it came from France, and it's at a frequency of about a half a percent in our population. It was there even when we didn't know that we should be looking for it, okay? So, and new mutations do occur, but they're pretty rare. So, given the size of our population, um, we're not doing something that's making more mutations happen more often. We're just finding them when in the past we wouldn't have found them, especially these defects associated with early fertility loss. Because when you have that early loss of embryos, it simply looks to us as though the cow didn't conceive, um, rather than she's got a genetic problem. So a few years ago, uh, I was working with um, Paul Van Raden and my technician, Dan Null, we were wanted to ask some questions about the economic impact of all these recessives in the population. And so we came up with a very conservative estimate of at least $11 million a year in losses um, related, to, uh, related to these known mutations. And so losses in Holstein averaged just under a dollar per cow spread over the whole population. And this was based on figuring out when does the loss occur and what is the economic impact of that loss and then sort of multiplying some things by each other. And this work was published in Journal of Dairy Science. And so this is related simply to these known genetic defects. Obviously we can't look at the no defects. And it's only related to their impact on fertility and on early, like perinatal mortality. So say basically stillbirth. Although you do have situations like Holstein cholesterol deficiency where the calf is born and then dies later, right? And that's absolutely the worst case because at the end of it all, you have a whole pregnancy and you don't have a viable calf out of it. Actual losses are almost certainly higher because there are loci that we don't know about. And another thing that's important to know about inbreeding is that we don't really know how much is too much, okay? We talk about um, we want to avoid inbreeding. We know it has harmful effects. Um, what I did here, um, okay, and well, before I get to the figure, the other thing is, as was discussed by Dan, our selection indices now include a lot more traits, including traits in particular related to fertility, longevity, these fitness and health traits, okay? This helps us avoid mistakes that we've made in the past. Dan, I think it was Dan, showed the figure, for example, where um, after we started doing selection on animal model in the late 80s, and we were selecting essentially for milk, we made huge progress in increasing milk production, 
but we weren't paying attention to fertility. And while we weren't paying attention to fertility, there was a substantial decrease. With the changes we've made in the last 20 years to our selection objectives, we're much less likely to do that. I'm not, I'm not gonna say we won't do that or couldn't do that, because we are, you know, we're imperfect, we do our best. But we're a little bit smarter about it than we used to be. So what, what you're seeing here on the right, I just took the uh, PTAs for all of the active Holstein bulls from the April 2019 genetic evaluation. I took away the inbreeding penalty on the PTA for DPR, and then I regressed it on inbreeding. And so what, what does all that mean anyway? That just means that what we see is a, a, uh, the relationship, which is up at the top right, the correlation of inbreeding with DPR is negative and moderate. What that means is, as we inbreed more, we do have negative effects on fertility. That doesn't surprise any of us, but I wanted to actually see it. And one of the, th I said we don't know how much is too much, so what's going to happen? As we continue to increase rates of inbreeding in the population, are we gonna just see a gradual decline in related traits? Or are we gonna hit a wall all of a sudden? We don't actually know the answer to that. And you could say, well, why don't you go look in the, the scientific literature and look at the data on flies and plants and things where you can inbreed for hundreds of generations? And we've done that. The problem is there's no consensus there either because things work differently in different species. And this reminds me of a quote. There was an interview once with Ernest Hemingway, right? And the, the interviewer said, well, how is it that you went bankrupt? And Hemingway replied, gradually and then suddenly. And that's my concern about inbreeding is that because we don't know where this, this, this wall is or where the cliff is, we may feel as though we're doing fine. And then all of a sudden we find out that we've crossed a point of no return, if you will, and all of a sudden the consequences go from negative but manageable to very harmful and potentially unmanageable. So how do we measure inbreeding? I'm gonna go through this quickly. There are no equations, I promise. I stole this slide from my colleague, Christian Malteca. It's fair because he stole a bunch of my slides for his talk at Dairy Science on Monday. So think of it as a mutual agreement. So pedigree inbreeding, right, is basically figuring out what genetic material is passed, what proportion of genetic material is passed from parent to offspring. So an individual is assumed to have half their DNA from their parents, one quarter of their DNA from each of their grandparents, one eighth of their DNA from each of their great grandparents, et cetera, et cetera. Well, with genomic inbreeding, we don't look at the pedigree, we look at the genotype. And we say, how many of these genetic markers does each animal share in common? And what we find is if you see this, this graph here that's in green, the red line is showing you the pedigree relationship if you mate a brother and a sister. That coefficient of relationship is one half. But if you measure actual um, matings of brothers to sisters, you find that there's actually a distribution around that point. That is, in some cases, you get a little bit more of the same DNA. In other cases, you get a little bit less. Okay, now. Another trick with pedigree inbreeding. I have one simple trick that you can use to dramatically reduce the inbreeding, the pedigree inbreeding of every, of every Holstein cow in the country. Okay. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna cut the pedigree off at 1990. And all of a sudden, a bunch of your inbreeding goes away. And then the age, okay. Um, and Mike talked a little bit, Corey's letting me know I need to move it along, that um, that the age of the inbreeding may matter. Did inbreeding happen recently so there's been no time to purge harmful loci or has it happened in the past and we have had time to purge? Now inbreeding is a property of an individual animal based on the DNA they've inherited. And many of you I hope are familiar with expected future inbreeding as well, which is actually a property of the population. And it's based on how related an individual animal is to the other animals in the population. So as, as an example, I have Oman. His expected future inbreeding is 10.4%. That's because there are so many Oman sons and grandsons, and therefore there are so many Oman daughters and granddaughters in the population. Um, now, Mike mentioned runs of homozygosity, uh, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, 
The point is, these runs of homozygosity give us a new way to identify places in the genome where inbreeding has occurred so that we can try to better understand them. So uh, as an example, there are many harmful alleles in the population that don't result in the death of an animal, but it results in decreased fertility or decreased milk production. And this is uh, showing some work by the folks at uh, North Carolina State where they've actually gone in and used runs of homozygosity to identify regions in the genome that are responsible for this decrease. So the question to us scientists is, can we come up with a clever way to take advantage of this information and use it in mating? Is inbreeding changing in the Holstein breed? I think we've already seen a variation of this graph. The bottom green line is the expected future inbreeding of the, of the Holstein cows. It's going up steadily. Um, some folks feel that the broken line that indicates the uh, genomic inbreeding of the young bulls and genomic inbreeding of the progeny tested bulls is quite alarming. Um, I don't like the trend necessarily, but if you look at the expected future inbreeding, it's lower. That does not get us off the hook. This is elevations for generation pedigree. No pedigree inbreeding, negative genomic inbreeding. What is negative, what is negative inbreeding? That just means he's actually less related to the population on average than expected. Yes, if you go back another generation, there is some inbreeding in elevations pedigree. But uh, we'll look at B.W. Marshall. Dan, ta uh, Dan talked about him indirectly when he talked about our, our improvements in stillbirth. B.W. Marshall had lots of sons, and he was terrible for daughter stillbirth. So we see some stacking up in his pedigree, some chief and some mark. His uh, genomic inbreeding is 9%. That's a little higher than we might like to see. And now I looked at a pine tree Acura ET. This is the top young net merit bull in the country. And this pedigree is crazy because you have a full sib mating on the maternal side, you're stacking up mogul, and then on the sire side, you have another full sib um, to the two in the bottom half of the pedigree. This is a problem. This is a bull with 17% genomic inbreeding, 13% pedigree inbreeding. You know, this is what I was talking about earlier when I said we're ending up in this race where there's no ending point. Yep, where everyone's trying to go faster and faster and faster to get higher and higher and higher index. So what can we do about it? Well, I think I'm not gonna step on Chad's talk here, but I think he is gonna talk about some recent research he and his team have been doing to try to better understand what we've lost in terms of genetic diversity over time as we've made more and more um, efficient selection. I say efficient in the sense of going faster. Um, I'm not commenting on was it desirable. Um, early in the genomics era, uh, this is a, a figure from Progressive Dairymen, there was an effort by many of the AI companies to sample broader pedigrees, okay? People didn't buy most of those bulls. And there are lots of ways that scientists have come up with to manage inbreeding in your mating programs. There are a lot of them, and nobody uses them. There are lots of reasons for that. Scientists don't mate cows, farmers mate cows. Um, you know, and because of the way the size of farms and the management needs of farms have changed over time, it's not necessarily possible to give every cow 20 minutes of your attention. You know, if you've got 1,000 cows to breed today, that's not gonna happen. And um, everybody else thinks that their neighbor should use a different group of bulls to slow down the inbreeding. And y'all don't have to respond to that, but think about it and ask yourself if it's not true. In the US, we adjust our PTAs for inbreeding, so we've already accounted for inbreeding depression. When you see those values, Corey, I'm, I'm wrapping up here. And this is just showing you, um, for the bull I mentioned earlier, for Acura, if we take away the inbreeding depression, his PTA would actually be almost $1,300 of net merit. So that's how good that bull is based on his DNA, that when you take away, you take away almost $300 in net merit and he's still at the top of the list. Um, that's kind of how selection works. So what do we do? Well, male genetic diversity is already very limited in the Holstein population. My, uh, Mike mentioned, I think it was Mike, uh, the effective population size is down to 50. 
If you were a conservation geneticist, you would, you would uh, consider that population endangered in a genetic sense, okay? We need to conserve our female variation in the population as best we can. Inbreeding depression may be responsible for some of the changes we've seen in fertility. Why are people having to use tools like double ovsync and put you know, 10 injections in a cow to get her pregnant? Because we've got some problems there. And Mike sort of, I think, alluded to the consumer opinion on this. How would the people who buy you know, your milk and your cheese and your butter feel if they knew that it took all of those injections to get that cow pregnant? So we do need to pay attention to inbreeding and we do need to look for ways around it. I was told I'm not allowed to talk about crossbreeding. Um, here's what I will say about crossbreeding. Crossbreeding is a short-term solution to the problem. It is not a long-term solution to the problem, okay? And I just showed you the way we're starting to stack pedigrees up more intensely than we have in the past. And that's a problem. And what we're gonna end up doing is looking more like pigs and chickens. That's not necessarily bad. Just ask yourself if you want your dairy enterprise to be run like a poultry or a swine operation. And um, look, inbreeding is complicated. If it was a simple problem to deal with, we would have already dealt with it. Right, we would, there's no simple solution. There's no use bull A instead of bull B. It's not that simple. There's no purchase semen from this company instead of that company. It's not that simple. It's going to take you know, a commitment on everybody's part to actually on the part of the AI companies to identify broader outcross pedigrees. It's going to take a commitment from each of you to purchase semen from some of those bulls so that they actually is an, is an incentive to uh, to keep producing those animals. We need to ask ourselves, are we willing to give up a few dollars a year of net merit or of TPI for the broader long-term good of the population? And uh, so there's a lot to think about here, and that's my final take-home message. There is no easy magic trick here. We got ourselves into this over more than 100 years, and I don't know if it'll take us 100 years to get out of this situation, but it's not gonna go away tomorrow. I would like to thank uh, the taxpayers, all of you for supporting our research at USDA. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate and for helping with some travel expenses. Um, and USDA, if I mention specific products, that's not an endorsement. And uh, I know we're gonna have questions later in the day. I look forward to the chance to have, continue our discussion. Thank you.